Welcome back. This will be a very special episode for me. We will gather the first light of a nebula, and not just any nebula, the infamous North American nebula. And while it's just around the corner, we will put the Pelican Nebula on our picture too. The North American Nebula is situated in the Cygnus constellation, just around of our, one of our brightest stars, Deneb. The North American Nebula is about 2000 to 3000 light years away. It is um, mainly consisting of uh, hydrogen in its ionized form, and this is why we have this beautiful red color. The first one who described this nebula was William Herschel back in 1786 and it really has the form of the North America. It's fascinating. It has a size of 120 arc minutes, which means it is four times the size of the full moon, but it's so dim that you can't see it with your naked eye. You need a camera to really get this beautiful red color and the form of this nebula. Today we will use our beloved Canon ES60. It's a full frame camera with a really good um, sensor that is capable of taking pictures in very dark skies. It's especially good for taking Milky Way photos with short lenses. A side note here, I am not using the Astro modified version. Um, I'm still thinking about that and um, I wasn't really bought into the idea to take away this filter that is um, taking out all the hydrogen um, that you need to get this really really red colors. Um, I, I hope I will, I think I will do it later back in the future but um, for now I will still take my unmodified Canon ES60 and I think the pictures will be beautiful nonetheless but further along the road maybe I want to take more I wanted to gather more light and then I will consider this, but then I need another camera. So let's see our lens, shall we? Most of you know that I'm using the William Optics Zenifstar 73 430mm and it's a really really good apochromatic refractor that I've used with great effect uh, last time when I shot the uh, Andromeda Galaxy. If you want to see more about that, just click this link above. And as you can see, we have the fill flattener on this scope. Um, if you really need a field flattener or not, you can click this link to get an impression on why we need a field flattener and if it's really something you should consider after you've bought this scope or before you bought it, buy it. On top of this image train sits a William Optics guiding scope with a guiding camera. It's the William Optics 200 slash 50, especially for these cold winter nights. Uh, when I shot this image it was minus 10 degrees or something like this, you should consider buying dew heaters. Because of the cold uh, outside temperature, um, the lens is really prone on getting dew on, to, on the lens and uh, this will really really Im affect your image quality in a bad way. With these dew heaters the lens will get warmer um, and it will get about a dew point and with that um, the way um, the amount of dew on your lens will be uh, drastically reduced. The whole equipment will be controlled remotely with this mini computer. While I'm sitting in my warm apartment, I can watch my scope from uh, a chair inside and it will do all the work outside all on itself. On itself. It is a really convenient and easy way to do it. All this heavy lifting is done by this really really good uh, equatorial mount from Skywatcher, the HEQ5 Pro. Uh, I have another video on my first impression of it, but after I have taken some pictures, I have to say I am really impressed by this mount. Um, the guiding is good, the tracking is good, and um, it is just a perfect combination for my uh, scope and camera uh, with, uh, with all the weight you have there. There's still some room um, to put more on it. Um, but for now I'm really really excited about it and impressed. After assembling the mount and putting the image strain on top of it, it's time for polar alignment. And I love polar alignment. Back then I did it again with um, 
Yeah, looking through the guide scope and putting the Polaris or the um, North Celestial Pole uh, onto the correct position. You use the North Star or Polaris with that and because um, it is not always, it's not that center in the, in the, um, in the um, yeah, northern point of the hemisphere, hemisphere um, you, you need to put the Polaris on a specific point and for that you need to either do some calculations with your scope or you can just use a really neat app like Polar, Sky, uh, Polar Scope Align. It tells you exactly where you need to put uh, Polaris in your um, viewfinder uh, if you, when you're looking through the Polar Scope and um, that's a really really good way to do that. Still you have to do this tedious task to um, yeah, put your scope into the correct position with the altitude and azimuth um, but after some time you get used to it and it gets easier every time you do it. So if you're like me and had some problems with it in the beginning um, just stay put and you will get better eventually. So after finishing this tedious task I, let's go to our target shall we? So here we are in Nina again and um, the first thing I do is I'm going to go down here and connect everything I have on my scope. So the first thing would be my camera of course and that was pretty successful. I'm going to put in the default gain, it's 800 ISO. Um, I had a problem yesterday with the Andromeda Galaxy where I was wondering about the um, reducing number of stars uh, or the, the number of stars that uh, declined over time and I thought first that um, this was because of the seeing which was true too but in the end it was uh, a 100 ISO uh, with the same um, exposure time and of course this will uh, um, affect the number of stars you have in your picture. Uh, of course, it will also affect the image quality. With uh, 100 ISO, you will have much higher image quality, but um, and 800 ISO, especially on the Canon um, EOS uh, 60, is um, all right, um, and you can live with that. So uh, you have to, yeah, you have to take um, the disadvantage where where they are. So the next thing I will uh, connect is my scope. And let's see if that worked. Perfect, scope connected, it's parked currently. And we will unpark it already because I know I will need it soon. And the next thing we will do is connect the guider. So I'm going to start a PhD tube with that. Um, the camera should um, be available to in a second. And here we are, we see already some stars. They look pretty neat to me and um, the guiding will soon start. We don't need it at the moment, but we will start it soon. So the next thing we will do then is we will take a short image with our camera. Um, just one second, the highest ISO that I have available, uh, available um, so that I see if we have a good focus or not. I have already um, focused the um, a scope over the live view with my camera outside. Um, this is just a little test. And here it is. It's our first picture of the day and it's a really good uh, focus. We have Polaris uh, way back here. Um, but I can see already that it looks really good uh, to me here. Um, this is For me, this is all right. Uh, it could be maybe a little bit better, but I won't bother with that um, for now. Um, I'm happy. Uh, there's a Batinov analyzer here um, that is uh, available uh, with Nina, and uh, it's trying to um, check if the star is has a good focus, I think. Um, I don't get how this uh, works, but um, if I'm going to put it here, I have no idea. Uh, I have to read into that um, so that I get the idea. Maybe it is not good focusing, but um, for now I I don't see that uh, Nina has um, taken into account the uh, 
the, the real stripes here. So maybe we will choose a bigger star then. Um, I would love to do this uh, with Stellarium if it will work. Uh, maybe uh, a fresh restart and uh, a new night will help uh, Stellarium to um, to not crash all, all the time. I got the neat thing with uh, Stellarium and um, um, the telescope is that I have so much control on where I want to have the telescope. Um, so here is a mount. Uh, it's currently looking up to Polaris and uh, then we'll just take a look at Deneb. It's high up in the sky. Um, I'm going to switch on uh, the telescope here. Um, I think it already is actual object and then I'm going to press schwenken or slew how the Englishman would say and I can see from inside the telescope moving perfect. So here we go. Um, we um, Our telescope is now pointing to Deneb and we'll look into Nina again. And hopefully, if we have a really good alignment, uh, which I don't dare to hope, we will have Deneb in our view. So, fast exposure with the highest ISO I can get. And let's see where we are. That does not look near Deneb at all. So, our polar alignment doesn't seem to be as good as I hope it would be. Um, what I'm already seeing is uh, the stars are looking pretty good from the focus perspective. So I'm going to take off the button off mask and then we will do a three point polar alignment. So for the polar alignment, I'm going to do a different approach. Um, because my camera um, is a DSLR, it has a mirror in it. And the problem is that it's going to need, um, going to need a lot of exposures. Um, it's going to do an exposure and an exposure. It's looping one second or two seconds or whatever. Uh, I don't want that because uh, with the polar alignment, I need to see in which direction I'm going. And uh, that looked uh, in the internet, look, that looked quite fiddly. So um, what I will do instead is I'm going to polar align it with my uh, guiding camera. For that, I'm going to um, switch off PH2 again, and I'm going to switch the camera uh, to the all where we have it here, the guide camera. So now I'm um, uh, switching on the guide camera and um, what I need to do now, um, because uh, the sensor size and everything has changed, I think I need to change my profile here. Uh, this uh, I have already set up, so I need to um, unconnect everything again otherwise I can't change my profile then I will go to options and then I will going to set up this uh, load this profile here mm. so now I have load my profile and uh, this profile is for um, all the different uh, um, for the for the other camera so then I'm going to equipment again I'm going to connect my mount, I'm going to connect my camera, which is now the guide camera, and then I'm going to imaging, and then, so there's something with the pole mode, we will see about that. Okay, there is an error at the moment, I think. All right, camera connected, could not start pole mode. mode. I have never seen that before. The imaging had worked quite all right before I had tried it out but and right now I can't take any picture I think this has something to do with uh, PhD 2 uh, yeah I think this uh, will be the case so I'm going to switch off PhD 2 again and then I'm going to reconnect the camera mm, let's just ah, connect it now it's a success perfect so I can go to imaging and we're going to take a test exposure uh, so you can already see all the stars here and he's going to do it a lot of, of times because he's looping now. Um, so I will switch it off uh, for now and then we're going to three point. So now you can see that we are retrieving our first measurement point of our three star polar alignment. And here you can see now that the scope has uh, taken its first picture of the first position. 
then it will do another measuring point and after it is settled it will do another picture um, you will see so another um, picture that he's solving it and then he will do a, another one if he is done with that uh, so he fails a lot for now uh, you will see now he now he's good with them he's happy and then he's moving the scope to the next point and after settling the scope for five seconds then we should see another picture after an exposure and there you go here you can see now that we have um, our solution and here you can see the azimuth error the altitude error and the total error now uh, the next thing i would do is uh, turn my monitor um, outside so that i can see it from um, my balcony and then i can move the scope and the azimuth and altitude direction and to clear up this error. and this is a very neat way uh, you will see me doing this uh, now. Now I will use the knobs on the azimuth and the altitude on my mount and um, while I'm looking at the monitor I'm moving the mount at the correct position. After some time um, I will be able to get it close to where I want to have that. Um, usually what I will do, I will change it first in uh, one direction and after I'm close to a position like that, I'm going to change it in, let's say now, in the altitude, because after I'm changing it in the altitude, I will uh, surely do an error in the azimuth direction. And as you can see here, I'm pretty close with my azimuth, but after changing the altitude again, you should see me uh, getting an error with my azimuth again. And then we will see on how close I can get with my error. Um, now the total error here uh, you can see is uh, three uh, minutes. And uh, when I'm below one minute, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, and I wouldn't do anything else here. So after some adjustments, I should be able to get to my preferred, uh, to the to a more or less good error. As you can see here, now with that I'm pretty happy. Today we will use plate solving. Um, plate solving is a very neat, uh, neat way to get your image or your composition to a certain point or your object of interest and your camera or your scope and the mount will move to that composition and uh, you have a database like STAP in my case and it will compare all the stars in your image to this database and um, he will do some calculation and some solving and after that he knows exactly where you are hopefully um, after he is done he will tell the mount on how much he has to move on the right ascension or declination and after that he's taking another picture and he is controlling it again um, doing some calculations and as soon as he is in a certain margin of error he's happy and then you have the correct uh, position of your mount and your lens. Um, the neat way in all of this is that you can use uh, like this in Nina where you have the, your frame, if you have in, put in all the correct information, and you can do some really nice compositioning there. And after you've done here, um, you can the, the lens will be on the correct position. When you do it in another way, when you just look through your camera, especially these very dim nebulae, um, they are sometimes hard to spot on the camera if you're doing some short-term exposures, uh, or you have to wait a lot of a long time to get an exposure where you can see the nebula and can see your composition. With this plate solving it's different because you already have a beautiful image in the background and you can just take the frame here and uh, have maybe a good composition then. It's a really good way and I, I think I will never not use plate solving. Why should I? I have no idea.
Maybe you can leave a comment why I shouldn't use plate solving, but for me it's just a natural way on how to move your scope in the night sky. I've done it with uh, three point alignment and it was also okay and then you can use go to commands but it was never that exact like you have it in plate solving and after I've said, I've, I've said it already because especially because of composition and because if you want to do pictures um, maybe uh, on another night of the same object and you want to put these pictures into your integration time you need to have the, or you should have, an exact same composition of your frame that looks in the sky. With plate solving, this is way easier because um, you can rotate your camera. There's also a function in Nina, which I have already seen someone using it in the internet, perfect idea on uh, that you have to move your camera on how much you have to move your camera. This is this is a really neat thing. And I, I think it's um, it's perfect. So I would never, not use it. <laughs> Leave a comment if you say if you, if you have an, any idea why you shouldn't use it. So the next thing uh, we're going to do is we are um, looking for the object we want to shoot today. So it's, uh, it is NGC um, 7000. It's a North American nebula and after clicking in the sky atlas I'm you know, coming to the framing wizard. Um, the First thing, uh, or the next thing we need to do is we need to. So here you can see me putting in the correct data for my sensor. Uh, it's a Canon ES6C sensor. So after putting in the correct uh, amount of pixels in the width and height and the correct pixel size, you get uh, the correct um, window or the correct size of your uh, point, field of view and uh, now he's uh, after unpacking the scope of course he is going to slew the scope to the correct position and he will to try a plight sole and um, here we'll see on um, how this will work out after uh, the mount has settled for a bit and then there's an exposure for let's say 10 seconds and then we either see an error or we see a success. So there comes our exposure. Here we go. He's solving it now and as you can see, oh, we have an error with plate solving. So this is something that will happen quite often uh, in the beginning for me. Uh, um, and I wasn't sure why that was. Um, first of all, I thought it has something to do with the uh, width and height um, of my sensor that I have the cor incorrect values um, but after some time I um, checked again and uh, I was trying to do uh, was checking here the image to see if I'm uh, seeing anything that looks like a nebula and as you can see uh, I couldn't find anything so I was going back to the framing and so now on the options uh, I was uh, again uh, for the plate solving I was changing the exposure time again I was happy there and then we went back to framing I'm going to now to abort this uh, failing plate solve and I just try to do it again um, try and error as always works in astro photography too uh, taking an exposure, checking if I am now in the correct position or close to something and trying to get a plate off. And again, failing. Why is that? Why should it fail? Or why is it failing all the time? Uh, as I have already said, I have this uh, happening with the beginning with my journey with the ES6D uh, a lot. And um, I just had to, of course, just restart everything. And usually... So now he has a correct plate solve and um, he sees that he is not in the correct position. So he's moving the scope to the um, position he thinks that should be right. And after some settling, he is going to do another exposure and let's see. Maybe he is getting closer to the position I wanted to be. And 
the varying image and here we go and, and you can already see uh the faint outline of this nebula um i can't i don't know if you can see it on your monitor but i can see it already uh after the three seconds exposure but or maybe it's just me thinking that i can see something but um he's pretty pretty close to where he should be and um hopefully he will be centered for now and now he's happy and when he is happy, I am happy. I am happy with that composition. And you get this beautiful Palican Nebula too. It really is astonishing. And after I've, I've seen it, I was first of all, first I said, why North American Nebula? Why Palican Nebula? But after I've seen this picture, I was totally, I was blown away. I said, okay, of course, this is North American. Of course, it's a pack and Pelican. Now it's time to start guiding with our trusted PhD2. Press here, dummy. I have already shown you in my latest video uh, when I have shot uh, the Andromeda Galaxy um, on how you use it um, in a compressed way. Um, for now we just start PHD2, we start the guiding process and after that he starts guiding with a few stars he has seen. After the guiding is settled we are doing some test exposures and then that's the real deal. Now look at that. There you can already see the North American Nebula and uh, now I wanted to see the uh, composition so I was uh, determining the rotation of my camera and uh, after he has taken a an exposure he now sees the rotation and as you can see here I got the Pelican Nebula in my picture and the North American Nebula too and I was pretty happy with this um, with uh, portrait um, composition of them both here um, also with the other nebulosity on the lower part of the frame after rearranging the frame he needs to check if he is still in the correct position which is of course not so he's doing a exposure again and after plate solving he's moving the scope to the correct position here we go the first 120 second exposure in the sequencer in nina i have con uh, taken a, um, a sequence here that takes a lot of pictures over some time. I have chosen three minutes exposure with an ISO of 800 and I tried to do 40 of them. Uh, it was a really 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 clear sky, it was perfect condition, there was no cloud in the sky and Cygnus and the uh, North American Nebula was high up in the sky and I had really I had some great hours down um, uh, back then. After I had all my images uh, on the sensor and onto the memory card I took some calibration frames uh, you need if, you, if you're serious with that hobby I haven't mentioned it in my last video but I did it of course if you're serious in this hobby you need to do calibration frames um, all these sensors especially these of the DSLRs are have problems with heat that is um, generated by the camera itself and other stuff I don't want to get too much detail because today. I will do another video about this, but let's just say you have to do calibration frames. Otherwise, you will have so much error on your data, if not only for all dust on your sensor. Um, for that, you need flats. And uh, bias frames are easy to do. Um, you need to do them on the same temperature. You're uh, doing images uh, on a dark um, that is dark, and the image need to be dark and um, you take it on the um, uh, um, shortest exposure and then you need uh, dark frames which are dark images with a, a lens on uh, top of it and on the same exposure and the same uh, ISO and the same time and you need to take like 15 or 20 images of them you need to take that into calculation uh, in your in your imaging night because you should use the same temperature of the sensor with a dedicated astromo, astronomy, uh, astronomy camera this isn't that much of a problem because most of them have a, a cooler inside that can take the image uh, the, the, uh, the, the camera temperature down to my, let's say just minus 10 degrees so you could do a picture in the night 
and um, if you use all the um, dark sky you had then you can take the calibration frames on the next day because you can cool your camera down to minus 10 degrees. This isn't the case for the DSLRs or the system cameras like let's say an EOS RP. The problem here is that you can't control your temperature in your sensor. You could of course put your camera into a, freeze or a freezer or into a uh, refrigerator but this is just rather cumbersome I think. Um, the best idea is to just take these uh, calibration images while your camera is still outside and has nearly the same temperature. So for these dark frames you took and take them at the same temperature with the same exposure and it's just dark with the same ISO of course. And you need to do some flats. Um, just to so say flats are there for getting out all the errors on your sensor like uh, dust and with that you can um, or you're the vignetting stuff like this. I don't want to get too, too much detail they're a little bit cumbersome to use uh, or to do uh, but you have to do it there's no way around it if not if you don't take any of them please you do flats because uh, you will see the dust errors on your image. Um, I will do a whole tutorial on that if you're really interested in that and um, I can show you on how I do it. Um, if so, please leave a comment. Let me know if you want to see something like this. Um, I think it's really interesting um, and you need to do it. It's easy, as easy as that. If you're going that way with all the camera and all the gear, you need to de do these extra steps. Otherwise, you, won't, you will be disappointed with the image. So, that was a really beautiful night. Um, I was so happy after I, see, I saw the results and um, I had to do of course some post-processing otherwise you won't see much with these images. Um, for me, after coming from an um, astrophotographer who is doing Milky Way photos with, uh, with uh, foreground and everything, it's just another way to do post-processing. Of course I had some, I had some um, experience with that so it wasn't that hard. There are a lot of good tutorials out there and I suggest you uh, just look up post-processing nebulas uh, in Photoshop. And um, I have done also some in Pix inside um, with a test period and I'm impressed by this program but because I already have Photoshop I'm still using that and um, I think I will later definitely go to Pix inside but for now I, I just want to take all the steps. I don't want to do any shortcuts. I just want to experience the whole thing. Um, this is why I had not done plate solving in the beginning, not done three point polar line with the Nina. I want to do all this, I want to experience it by myself. And um, this is why some of you have already mentioned so many good things and I had them already in my mind but I said no, I just want to do these steps step by step. And so I'm, I'm now I know on how difficult it is to do polar alignment but I'm also appreciating so much more the freestyle polar alignment. And um, with plate solving it's the same thing. After I've done three point star alignment and I took picture and I know oh that's, the, that's not the correct position I have to do it just a little bit more way over there and all of the stuff. Now I'm so happy with plate solving. I think you need to experience that to get into the idea on why you should have upgrades on certain points. And when you don't have these programs or these nifty stuff, like if, you, if you're going on a, on a vacation and you have all your stuff but not a computer with you and you still want to do some pictures, then you will be very happy to know how to do your uh, image composition without plate solving uh, on how you would polar line without a polar finder like um, these cool cameras that you can put there or without uh, freestyle pole alignment. You need to do this to experience it as yourself. And um, I want to share that with you. This is why I did. So um, I'm going to show you uh, in a few seconds on how my image worked out and I was really happy with that. If you like this video and you want to see more of that, uh, please press the, th press the thumbs up button. Feel free to subscribe if you want to get notifications on my next videos. And if you want to say anything, if you have suggestions or um, if you want to share with your own thought process uh, or your own process in astrophotography, please feel free to leave a comment down below. Um, I'm really happy that you're, uh, I got 
so many comments and so many likes and uh, subscribers already and I'm really appreciating uh, all of it and um, I love to share my journey with you. So I'm stop talking now and uh, thank you very much and uh, take care all of you and have a lot of, lots of clear skies in the next weeks and thank you very much. Bye.